Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is John Tanzer and I'm the uh, leader for WWF's Ocean Program, the global program. Very pleased to be here. I'm going to be moderating this, uh, this session today. Um, and today we're, we're pleased to be showcasing the work of WWF Pacific, the 25 years that WWF Pacific has been working and operating um, and, and in particular, the theme is building the case for a sustainable blue economy oh. in the Southwest Pacific. Um, the, uh, someone's just got their, uh, can I ask folks to turn off their, their mics if they've left them on, thanks. Thanks. Um, so pushing on, the, the, the session will showcase WWF Pacific's milestones and best practices over this past 25 years, in Fiji, Solomon Islands and, and PNG. And also we'll have a look at, uh, at the organization's plan for the next five years. I'm very, I said I was very pleased to be moderating that session. I say that in all sincerity, um, the Pacific and, and the work of WWF Pacific is, uh, is something that I'm particularly interested in and pleased to support. It is of major significance to WWF globally. We know the natural riches and over the last few days, there's been the opportunity to have deep dives into uh, looking at the particular circumstances, the assets, the wildlife, the habitat, uh, and of course the great cultural diversity um, and, and prowess in terms of community management that there is there. Um, our work, as I said, is conducted in the region, in the Solomon Islands, in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, and we work in close coordination with WWF uh, New Caledonia as well. I just want to emphasise our mission and WWF Pacific's mission. A lot of thought's gone into this. It's to ensure that the richness and resilience of our Pacific Island ecosystems are managed and conserved in harmony with the aspirations and sustainable development needs of our people. To do this, we work in partnership, we collaborate with Pacific Island governments, regional organisations, the private sector, philanthropists, donor agencies, academia, our close colleagues in, in other civil society organisations, and most importantly, with the communities on the ground. This is an integral part of our endeavours. We're looking at working closely, as I mentioned, um, with corporate entities, in the South Pacific to help them move towards a more resilient and resilient um, blue economy business model um, and one which uses an integrated ecosystem based adaptation approach. And this phrase, which is, which is uh, so uh, fundamental to our work, I think you'll hear more of from our speakers as we go forward. We strongly advocate this approach, ecosystem based adaptation and management. It ensures that issues are not addressed in isolation, but as part of the larger array of interactions within an ecosystem with inclusive approach and human beings being at the centre. It includes our policy and legislative work, advocacy work, and uh, also the protection of customary cultural and heritage rights of Pacific Island people, so that we can work with them to ensure that the natural environment is managed in a sustainable and regenerative manner and promote the socio-economic development and aspirations of Pacific Island communities. So with those few words of introduction, we have a very expert panel with us who are going to deal with the different aspects, various aspects of the work from WWF Pacific. Um, I'll run quickly through the list of speakers before I hand over to the first one. Um, from the Solomon Islands, we have, Ms., um, we have Minnie Rath, Community-Based Fisheries Management Program Coordinator, uh, we also have our focal point there, Shannon Sito is on the line. Good to see Shannon joining us, able to join us. WWF Pacific PNG, Rebecca Samuels, Coastal Marine Madang. Um, we have Duncan Williams, who's the manager for sustainable fisheries and seafood in the South Pacific from WWF F uh, Pacific Fiji. And uh, we also have uh, WWF Pacific Fiji, Alfred, Ralifo from the Great Sea Reef um, area and program and policy coordinator for the region. And pleased also to have joining us uh, Jody Smith, who's a partner with us from Matanataki uh, Proprietary Limited. Welcome, Jody. Um, so we'll run through 
uh, a series of presentations. Hopefully we'll have time at the end, we will have time at the end for um, some questions and, and uh, also some concluding comments. Uh, the speakers will speak for around seven minutes each and, and, I'll, uh, and I'll do my best to keep them that, to that. Uh, without any further words, um, Minnie, can I turn over to you as the first speaker on the list? The floor is yours. Thanks, Minnie. Hi, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Are you doing okay there, Minnie? You just need to hit the share screen button and select yep. your PowerPoint. Can you guys see the screen? Perfect. Thank you. All right, so I'll start. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I'm currently working with um, WW Solomon Islands Program Office to coordinate the implementation of an integrated approach to community-based fisheries management in the Western Province in Solomon Islands. I'm pleased to also share with you our key achievements in the last eight years of our work program here. Okay, so this is where we're at with our work. Um, this is the map of Solomon Islands, and these are some of the islands that make up Solomon Islands. WWF is currently working with communities in the Western province, as highlighted in the map. So Western province is the home to a greater levels of biodiversity than any other part of the country. Therefore, our work there aims to reduce pressure on these vulnerable um, reef systems. So just an overview of the program. Um, our program is called Sustainable Coastal Communities Program in the Solomon Islands. And we're implementing that in different components. But the core of our uh, program is fisheries management giving communities the tools to make their own more sustainable fisheries management decisions. Um, linking to that um, is our financial inclusion component, which uh, uh, looks at empowering women to enable alternative income generating activities that would also enhance uh, food security and livelihood. So um, this financial inclusion is an integral part of our strategy. Now, primary targeting women in our approach is different to many other microfinance schemes. It goes beyond savings and small loans to really emphasize women's empowerment and capacity building. We do realize also that this uh, business model allows for women, women's economic advancement as well as empowerment. And then there's also, uh, we just adopted a climate change lens into our work program, and that is uh, that comes under the community adaptation pathways. It's still in pilot at the moment, but it really focuses on providing communities with a framework for longer term thinking, intergenerational planning and a systems view of individual and community adaptation. So it sort of puts the community on the driver's seat for their own plans for climate change adaptation. We have been on a very exciting journey in the past years and looking back, the financial inclusion has been a success. To this date, 1000 women have joined WWF supported saving clubs and there are 145 micro businesses being established across 17 saving clubs. As an alternative for other income sources, this component has enhanced the livelihood of a number of the women members with total savings so far reached um, Solomon SBD 400,000. Social economic service have shown significant diversification in sources of household income between 2013 and 2018. This diversification suggests a reduction in the level of economic 
dependence on fishing amongst these communities. Um, the sea grapes, sea grapes management is a milestone under our fisheries component. It is a community initiative, which is a product of the series of um, WWF supported uh, capacity building. So um, women, women from that community are seeing the tangible benefits of managing the sea grapes as a fisheries resource under our CDFM work. We also recognize the training of local women trainers as another milestone. It has really, um, it has achieved its objectives to support the scale out of this component to other interested communities within and outside of our focus area. Under the fisheries component as well, we have developed a total of community uh, management plans, fisheries management plans. These communities currently are in full engagement with CBFM uh, activities. And then with our CAPSI um, climate change lens, we have supported the development and now the implementation of two community adaptation projects. And these are in our two pilot sites. So these are some of the achievements. And moving on, we also recognize the, um, the CF model, which is a community facilitator, facilitator model, um, is another, as a, as another great milestone for us. As, as in a way it is helping communities to prepare themselves for when WWF uh, leaves their site. It supports uh, WWF as well to scale out the CBFM work to other nearby communities who are genuinely keen to do CBFM with minimal support. Um, all in all, um, we realize our integrated um, approach has been one of the greatest achievements. Moving on, um, in the next five years, we would like to upscale this pony potential survey methodology, which is a um, innovative um, man uh, fisheries management approach that we've uh, been doing with uh, local fishermen. We'd, we'd like to upscale that. Um, it helps local fishers to take control of fisheries data and science. Um, data collected through this method helps to inform local management decisions. And over the eight years, we have supported more than five communities more sustainably manage their fisheries, and we are excited to start scaling it up. And one of the ways we're doing that is by working with James Cook University to develop a smartphone app that will use um, artificial intelligence to identify and measure the fish and then uh, later the photo to be analyzed using cloud technology. This will be something that is um, workable by the local fishers at the community level. It's early days and we're starting to, we are just starting to test the early version of this app, but we think um, it's going to be a game changer. Um, COVID-19 has led major impacts on communities and their fisheries. So um, one of the innovations we're testing at the moment is the deployment of um, the introduction of redesigned beach accessible rafters. So it works just like the inshore fishing aggregating devices. But it, um, if it's successful, we hope to roll this out to other communities that are struggling with population growth as well. So we also have plans for expansion to the east of the country. Um, over the next few years, we will take the lessons learned from our integrated approach and start to head east. Um, while we know that different islands and different communities will need to take different approaches and that what works in Gizo or where we're at right now won't work, won't necessarily work with um, other islands, we are confident that our integrated approach can be adapted to different contexts and scale up. Um, that's all for me. Thanks. Thanks very much, Minnie. That it's very interesting. Um, thank you for that for that presentation. I'm sure we'll come back to some of the points that you raised. Um, could I now turn to Rebecca Samuels from the Coastal Marine Program in, in Madang, WWF uh, Pacific PNG. Thank you, Rebecca. Minnie, if you could stop sharing your screen.
Hi, everyone. Let me just Hi, try Rebecca. and we'll just, we'll let me just, just try and see if yeah. Sorry. Maybe if you just close that window, uh, Minnie, could work. This one? Okay. Yeah. yeah. How's that? Yep. Now, Rebecca, you have the floor. Ah, so we lost Rebecca there. She was there a minute ago. No, she's still there. I'm just trying to share my screen. Yeah, okay, it's no no hurry. Um... Rebecca, you just hit the screen share, share screen button at the bottom and, and then select your, your presentation. Sweet. Okay. It started, but we just can't see it. It'll just take might take a moment to come up. There it is. Great. Okay. Oh. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Becca. Um, I am involved in the Medang Integrated uh, Ecosystem Program in the PNG country office. Um, I will try my best to talk a little bit about a program, but the country program, but I think my focus will be more on Medang. So basically, uh, WWF uh, PNG program has two focal areas. Uh, that's the Kiko River Basin Program and the Medang Inco Integrated Ecosystem Pro Program. Unfortunately, I didn't put a map so I can show you guys, but uh, Medang is on the north coast of PNG and Kiko is on the south, uh, the southern part of the country, which is uh, in the Gulf of Papua, which is closer to Australia. So basically, that's our two focal areas. So I think in the Pacific, we are the only country that has two one landscape and one seascape program. Um, PNG, uh, WWF has been in PNG since the mid 1990s. Um, the Kikori River Basin program focuses on uh, forests and the Medang Integrated uh, Ecosystem program focuses more on the coastal uh, fisheries, uh, more coast, yeah, marine work, um, which includes uh, community fisheries management, coastal rehabilitation, climate change mitigation, and as mini, sh mini shed um, with a component on the financial inclusion and uh, women empowerment, because uh, we do that together and it's under the WWF Australia support. So, the, so that is that um, it's uh, good to note that uh, both programs uh, have a lot to do with community involvement in develop, developing our um, project activities. This is done mostly by our community facilitators, facilitators network, which includes both, uh, which includes community people, which are both men and women. Okay, some highlights for the last 10 years. So in the last 10 years, the country program actually went through a transition, um, but, we have maintained our presence in the country. I mean, WWF has maintained its presence in the country and it's uh, slowly but surely growing. That's good. We have maintained our two focal areas, both in the Kiko River Basin and the Medang uh, Seascape. We have had a very strong link with our communities and um, who have been very supportive in our work. And we have developed this community facility network, which is something that we claim to be ours and which we have shared with uh, Solomon Islands. Um, so the highlights for the next five years, um, we would like to uh, maintain our community involvement through our community facilitators network and uh, community um, leadership. Um, 
we want we have we want to maintain a long presence in our focal areas building on the past work that we have been doing so that uh, we can achieve results and see change because um, we know that change don't happen in a short time we'd like to add value or incentives to what we have been working on uh, we'd like to uh, we've been and would like to maintain our communities as co-partners and we have been doing this through a formal partnership realizing that they are very important in implementing work in our target areas because in PNG, the situation is such that our communities still own all the resources that we'd like to manage. So it is very important that we maintain that. Huh? And of course, in the Medang program, we'd like to uh, take our work through an integrated approach. We have been very um, focused on the coastal um, side of things, but now we'd like to have a little bit more uh, work towards the, uh, the landscape as well. So it's we're looking at uh, a reef to a reach, reach to reef kind of approach in our Medang program. I think that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that. We'll we'll move on um, to Duncan Williams, who is the manager for the uh, WWF Pacific Sustainable Fisheries and Seafood Program. Um, Duncan, are you there? You ready to go? Hi, John. Just um, Hi, requesting, yeah, just requesting if uh, Rebecca could stop sharing her her screen. Yeah, I think Rebecca, you've stopped sharing your screen now. Yes, I have. Yep. Yeah. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Duncan Williams, uh, I'm the Sustainable Fisheries and Seafood Program uh, Manager based here in uh, Suva, Fiji. Uh, this afternoon I'll be providing just a brief overview of um, the Sustainable Fisheries and Seafood Program here in Fiji, basically what our focal areas are, uh, some of the achievements that we've um, um, managed to uh, come out with over the past few years that uh, have delivered to some of our focal areas. Um, I'll be focusing mainly on offshore fisheries as you'll see during the presentation. Uh, and the main reason for that is that Alfred Relipo, my counterpart uh, with the Great Sea Reef Program, will be focusing on intro, intro fisheries uh, later on in the uh, program. So just uh, to cover our focal areas, uh, the focal areas for the Sustainable Fisheries and Seafood Program, uh, we cover six broad, uh, or we target six broad areas around governance. Um, essentially, around in terms of our focus on governance, we are looking to work with uh, offshore fisheries, uh, industrial um, tuna fisheries uh, players. Uh, and by 2025, we're hoping to ensure that uh, fisheries within the WCPFC, within Fiji, as a starting point, as well as in Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, apply sustainable fisheries management standards and plans. Uh, and that's our objective, our, our five-year objective. For marine protected areas, uh, we're a bit ambitious, um, looking at ensuring that 100% um, of Fiji's exclusive economic zone is you know, effectively managed by 2025. Uh, and this is in line and supportive of uh, um, Fijian government's uh, uh, you know, uh, commitments. Uh, to achieving this uh, globally. Yeah? Uh, we also have a focus on marine species. Uh, our, one of our key objectives there is to, uh, to achieve a 50% reduction of bycatch of uh, endangered and threatened and protected species in Fiji's longline fishery. Uh, we also work on sustainable financing and industry uh, where we are looking at uh, our cost recovery. Uh, one of the key issues that we, we find is that uh, you know, a lot of the uh, management that's taking place uh, is, is done so uh, without getting enough uh, funds yeah, uh, to, to, to support uh, government ministries 
uh, you know, and their responsibilities to manage the fishery. And so we're seeing uh, gaps in terms of enforcement. Uh, and that's something we believe uh, needs to be addressed so that, uh, you know, when we're looking at effective management, uh, we can um, support government to achieve this. Uh, we also have uh, an objective around plastics, uh, looking at uh, ghost gear, uh, trying to understand uh, ghost fishing and, and the impacts of uh, ghost gear on, uh, on, on marine species, uh, in the long line fishery especially, and then uh, to hopefully develop a, a plan on, uh, and, and support some of the regional initiatives around that, around that work uh, over the next five years. Uh, also targeting climate change, the biggest, one of the key biggest threats to the Pacific at this point in time. Uh, and our plan is to, to work with the offshore fisheries um, uh, sector to understand the issues that are, that are going to impact them, not only out on the water in terms of the fisheries, but how they can actually adapt to the impacts of uh, climate change to the fishery. Um, so in terms of providing just highlights uh, from the program, we'll just be targeting just two specific areas uh, in terms of governance in marine species. Our marine protected areas work uh, has been ongoing where we've basically been supporting Ministry of Fisheries and the Ministry of Economy in, in their ongoing work to develop uh, uh, plans for protecting Fiji's exclusive economic zone. Um, but in terms of our other um, our, in terms of our other work uh, around bycatch mitigation, just giving you a brief highlight, uh, we've been working very closely with uh, uh, for example, with the Fiji Maritime Academy, uh, which is uh, falls under the Fiji National University, where we're um, ass assisting them to put in place, um, you know, um, uh, training programs with uh, bycatch element uh, incorporated uh, within that. We've been targeting and working very closely with our uh, private sector and uh, and, and tuna fisheries. Uh, our counterparts uh, from the PG industry, uh, PG Fishing Industry Association, who we'd, I'd like to at this point acknowledge, um, as well as the PG Maritime Academy. We've been targeting the PG Fishing Industry Association uh, and their, their workers to, um, to, to, to take up these programs uh, so that, uh, you know, basically they, you know, we, we provide that level of training and awareness to their, uh, to, to their fisher folk uh, so that that impact can be can be translated out into the into the water. Uh, you know, under that program, we've offered scholarships. Uh, we're happy to say that uh, you know over fifty percent, um, you know, of uh, participants in that uh, in that uh, course uh, have been women. Uh, so we we're very happy to support you know the the gender components and the gender um, uh, you know objectives. Uh, of, of the region yeah? and how that actually translate into uh, you know into the work in, in offshore fisheries uh, and we're realizing that through this uh, through this program uh, in terms of future work around bycatch mitigation we've uh, actually partnered with uh, SPREP uh, to undertake uh, work around uh, bycatch mitigation we're surveying uh, running a, a couple of surveys in partnership also with uh, BirdLife International and a uh, partner on the ground in Vanuatu to undertake surveys uh, of the long line fleets based out of Vanuatu and, and Fiji to understand just the uptake of uh, the levels of uptake of bycatch mitigation, uh, to understand you know, what, what those are, where there are gaps, and hopefully uh, at some later stage to then begin to address uh, some of those gaps. Uh, we're also supporting some of that work by also uh, providing you know, uh, things like bycatch mitigation tools, et cetera. So that's ongoing work that we're cur currently uh, implementing, but that's there's a current uh, uh, very strong relationships and very strong uh, partnerships that we have with the Fiji Fishing Industry Association, with the Ministry of Fisheries, uh, as well as the, these ac academic institutions. Uh, and as John had mentioned earlier in his introduction, um, you know, a lot of these programs, and um, you know, we don't just do them by ourselves. We rely very heavily on partnerships to make things work. And um, you know, just moving on, uh, you know, we've been very uh, as, as part of our uh, past 10 years, this office has been very uh, um, heavily focused on ensuring the sustainability of tuna fisheries, uh, particularly with the Fiji uh, offshore uh, tuna fleet. Uh, they were the, I believe, the first long line tuna uh, operation to be uh, MSC certified. Uh, we've continued that engagement with the industry uh, to ensure that, um, uh, you know, they, they maintain that certification. And, and has allowed us to also 
begin to roll out other as aspects of, uh, you know, of, of, of that conservation and management work. So we begin to sort of start bringing into, uh, into the program um, work around child and forced labor standards, uh, you know, in uh, working very closely with the Ministry of Fisheries as well as industry to, to raise awareness around these, uh, these new um, requirements. Yeah? Um, also very um, supportive of the surveillance uh, audit process, uh, as well as uh, traceab traceability yeah, and monitoring, uh, which also extends to bait fish, uh, which enters into the, the long line fishery. Um, so that that has been a, a, a big focal point of this office. Um, and that's something that we'll continue to, 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 to do uh, in terms of sustainability for offshore fisheries, not only in Tuna, but also supporting the Ministry of Fisheries uh, objectives uh, around a deep uh, to develop their deep uh, sea snapper fishery. Uh, and that's something that we'll be very keen to also support. Um, in terms of a uh, very interesting uh, component of, of our work around traceability is this blockchain technology. Um, I think everybody, uh, if you haven't already, you know, um, come across the term Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, these are all based on uh, the concept of blockchain technologies and uh, distributed ledger technologies. So we were very fortunate to have worked with uh, um, you know, a company by the name of Consensus, I believe, who have developed a, a blockchain uh, technology platform uh, and worked very closely with one of our local um, uh, tech providers, a uh, company by the name of Traceable, headed by uh, Kenneth Catofono uh, and his partner. Um, and, and I'd like to acknowledge this time, you know, that partnership, uh, which enabled us to not only test, but also, you know, provide the proof of concept that the blockchain technology can actually work and actually be something that uh, can be expanded across the fishery to provide that uh, high level of uh, traceability. Yeah? And uh, we, we, I believe under that, uh, under that project and that program, we were partnered also with a small long line fishing company in PG uh, to, to trial. Um, so, our next steps with that particular program is to expand it uh, to the rest of uh, the Fiji fleet and potentially across the Pacific. Uh, we're working very closely with our counterparts uh, across the network uh, to see where there's uh, appetite for this technology to be introduced. Uh, I believe uh, WWF Australia have already uh, been very heavily involved in the establishment of, uh, uh, of, of, of a blockchain traceability uh, um, entity uh, called OpenSC uh, that uh, WWF Pacific is working very closely with uh, uh, to explore options for rolling this out uh, in with other fleets. Um, Thanks, Duncan. Can can I ask you to to uh, say thirty seconds or forty seconds? Yeah. That'd be good. We're just right. going over time. Thanks. Just on my last slide. So just as I mentioned earlier, we do we've done a lot of work in terms of uh, supporting civil society engagement. Uh, uh, at regional forums, uh, WCPFC being, being the key one, but also locally, you know, we work with our civil society partners. I think the point that I wanted to make here is that uh, we work with a, raft, a range of, uh, of, of partners, uh, CSO, civil society partners, as well as donors. And our work is underpinned by that uh, partnership, and we see that that partnership is very crucial for ensuring that we have a um, really good uh, impact, a conservation impact out of the water. So, with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much. If there's anything, uh, you know, any additional information you'd like to know about the Sustainable Fisheries and Seafood Program, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Duncan. Yes, and if you have any any questions or comments in the audience, please post them, um, and uh, and we'll come back to them at the end, time allowing. So thanks very much, Duncan. If if you could um, stop sharing your screen, which you probably have. But um, now I'll move on to Alfred, uh, Great Sea Reef Program Manager. Relifo, Alfred Relifo, um, well known, hard working. Alfred, the floor is yours. Oh. Uh, Vilaka, everyone, and thank you for uh, listening in to our side event. And before I, I, I talk about the WF Pacific's Great Sea Reef Program, I'd like to acknowledge um, our previous speakers, uh, especially our Rebecca from Papua New Guinea and also Mini from the Solomon Islands uh, and also Duncan as well. I must say that one of the benefits uh, and the perks of uh, 
of uh, working for WF Pacific is that we have uh, uh, three sister offices uh, implementing activities at the community level and also at the national level. And uh, the, the added value of being able to share information and to work together and to, to learn from each other is, has been very, very uh, helpful. And uh, I think it's uh, very rewarding to, to be part of such an organization. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to present uh, our Great Sea Reef program on behalf of my Great Sea Reef uh, program team. Uh, Fiji's Great Sea Reef is locally known as Bai Viti or Bai Nivu Liquor, and it is the third longest reef system in the world. And it's the most diverse reef system here in Fiji, spanning more than 200 kilometers long. There were four, four of the six major rivers in Fiji uh, drains out into this Great Sea Reef, and two of the major deltas um, and mangrove systems, and much of the sea grasses are important for turtles and fish nursery grounds. Uh, and as uh, uh, you may have heard in uh, other presentations and um, uh, throughout the conference, the Great Sea Reef here in Fiji is also identified as one of the top 50 most resilient reefs in the world. And it's a uh, uh, very, very central to Fiji's life culture uh, for centuries. And now it's very, very important in terms of Fiji's economy. Um, but however, the Great Sea Reef faces many uh, numerous unprecedented challenges. Now, WF's focal of uh, intervention uh, on the Great Sea Reef. Let me change to the next slide. Uh, so this is the Great Sea Reef. Uh, and for since 1995, we have been heavily engaged in this uh, uh, reef system, working with the local communities and also with national authorities in terms of uh, trying to, uh, to, to conserve and protect the, the reef system. So this is the Great Sea Reef land and seascape that WF is now working in. Um, and uh, also um, the entire population of this, uh, of this land and seascape is about 41.5% of Fiji's total population. Uh, and the entire land and seascape makes up about uh, 28,181 square kilometers of uh, terrestrial uh, and marine area. So in 1995, this area here highlighted in the red circle over here, this is where WF first engaged with the community over there, uh, working with the women of, uh, of Mother Water to try and uh, um, uh, protect and revive their freshwater kuta ponds. These kuta ponds are actually quite important because they, there's a special uh, freshwater reed that grows in the pond that is very, very useful in terms of uh, traditional mats and costumes. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it helps to empower the women of, the, of uh, Mother Water to be able to, to support uh, their livelihoods, revive uh, and um, continue to pass on the knowledge of weaving to, their, uh, to the new generations that are coming up, but at the same time also protect the, the, the ecosystem and restore the associated habitats uh, associated with these uh, kuta ponds. Uh, and uh, since 1995, uh, when WFS engaged with the community and with the in invitation from the traditional uh, paramount chief of uh, Mother Water province, uh, and from then till now, this uh, initiative has uh, grown from a local initiative to a global sensation, or uh, if I may say. Um, this section of the Great Sea Reef is now in, uh, nine, in 2018 has been declared by the Fiji government as one of Fiji's uh, Ramsar sites. So this will be the second Ramsar site for Fiji and it is, uh, um, and it is located along the north coast of uh, Fiji's Great Sea Reef. Now, in addition to that, um, WF has been working with uh, local communities to establish the community long-term sustainable development plans. And of course, a sustainable fisheries um, and sustainable management of their, uh, of their natural resources is integrated as part of their long-term sustainable development plans. Uh, and we hope that uh, in, 10, in 10 years time, come 2030, all the communities along this uh, entire uh, land and seascape would have their sustainable development plans up and running and uh, uh, we are fully implementing and supporting the implementation of these plans. Um, I would also like to add that uh, last year there was a, um, a Great Sea Reef survey that was uh, facilitated by the Ministry of Fisheries together with the uh, University of South Pacific, University College of London, National Geographic uh, uh, Society and also WWF. Um, and the report for this uh, recent uh, biological survey will be coming out very shortly in the next uh, few weeks. So please keep on watching this space for some amazing discoveries and also 
to be able to understand uh, the current impact of human activities on the status of this reef system. I would also like to mention, draw your attention to a recent um, a survey that was facilitated in the Ducati catchment by a very, um, uh, by um, the University of the South Pacific. This survey was led by Andrew Paris. Um, and as part of the Great City Program, uh, WF Pacific sanctioned a shark and ray survey of uh, the Ducati catchment, which is within the Ramsar site. Um, the Ducati River and estuary is located within the Ramsar site. And uh, out of the, the, the results uh, that was uh, from the survey that was facilitated earlier this year showed that um, this, this um, estuary is actually an important uh, nursery for sharks and rays and would most probably be the largest uh, nursery of shark and rays here in Fiji and maybe the South Pacific, but that is yet to be, we hopefully this could be confirmed uh, soon. Um, the survey was conducted over a period of 20 days and out of the 20 days, um, 85 Alfred? species, yes. Alfred, sorry, to, sorry to cut in and, and not to disrupt you at all, but uh, the, the uh, translators are just having a little bit of trouble keeping up. Uh, so if you could you just speak a little bit more slowly, you're covering a lot of information here. So, okay. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, so just let me reiterate, as part of the Great Sea Reef Program, the Drakete Reef and Estuary uh, Elasma Branch Survey sought to prove claims from local communities that the area had an abundant and diverse population of sharks and rays. So the survey was conducted over a period of 20 days and of the 85 species captured and released, there were four species of sharks, the scalloped hammerheads, great hammerheads, black tips and bull sharks, and three species of rays, the oscillated the eagle ray and the pink white whip ray and the bottlenose whitefish. So these, um, these species that had been captured has been identified and that is part of the IUCN red list. Um, the great hammerhead and the scalloped hammerhead and the bottlenose wedge fish are listed on the IUCN red list of threatened species as critically endangered. Uh, from the survey, the high proportion of juveniles of certain species encountered indicates that the Dugeti River and estuary is an important nursery for sharks and rays. Uh, the high CPOE, which um, um, the catch per unit effort, 85 individuals captured at 1.13 CPOE showed that Dugeti and the Great Sea Reef is a very, very important uh, area that needs to be protected so that uh, for our sharks and rays. So thanks to Andrew Paris and the work that USP had facilitated, um, uh, this is very, very important. We have already presented this uh, in information to the communities of Ndreketi and Madawata, and they are using this information to feed into their, to the, um, uh, the Ramsar site management plan. Now, in terms of the Great Sea Reef Resilience Program, um, the Great Sea Reef Resilience Program aims to keep the Great Sea Reef ecosystem healthy, which should result in multiple benefits for the associated coastal communities and businesses and Fiji as a whole. Um, there will be three main in areas of intervention for, the, for this uh, program for the next 10 years, building on the, and integrating lessons from uh, Madawata to other provinces uh, on the Great Sea Reef, the province of, uh, of Mba, Ra, and the, also the province of, uh, of Mbua. So the three major components um, for, the, for the next uh, uh, five years of the program is looking at addressing the major threats to the Great Sea Reef system. The first component looks at um, holistic land and mar marine use planning, ecosystems management and climate buffering focused on the Great Sea Reef to address destruction and clearing of habitats and ecosystems, and also to work with the communities and the national authorities to try and rehabilitate and um, uh, some of the lands, uh, the landscapes and the seas, um, uh, the, the ecosystems that had been degraded in the past two years. The second component, looking at the financial systems for regenerative production and practices with market outcomes to address, uh, to address unsustainable extraction, production and consumption, and more from a business as usual scenario to a sustainable and resilient blue economic uh, business plan. And this will include sustainable financing mechanisms through blended financing streams and reinvestment into the management of the Great Sea Reef land and seascape. Component three looks at um, 
knowledge management and monitoring of um, uh, an evaluation and lessons integration. And this is where documentation and ensuring best practices are captured and replicated to other parts of uh, Fiji and also to the Pacific. Uh, and um, we are also looking at sharing this with our um, sister offices in the, the, the Solomon Islands program, as well as with the PNG program. Hopefully in the next um, uh, 10 years, we will ensure we will work with the local authorities and the communities to ensure that all the catchments draining out into the Great Sea Reef have the integrated catchment management plans supporting uh, the community-led marine managed areas and also the protected areas on this reef system to try and address the uh, land-based activities and impacts on the health of this reef system. Uh, in terms of our next slide, so this is um, um, a summary of so Alfred, um, if, if just a couple of uh, um, couple of minutes, thanks, if you could. Yeah, thanks. This is um, my final slide. Um, it's actually um, I, it gives you a summary of uh, the type of uh, partnership that we have established over the years and um, moving forward, and also the type of blended finance uh, funding stream that we have uh, envisioned for this program for the next ten years, especially for the Great Series program. So we have more than 50 plus local and regional stakeholders that are part of this uh, multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, and this was, uh, has grown since 2017 when we started to plan and redesign the Great Sea Reef Program for the next uh, 10 years. And also we have uh, been working very closely with the, global, the WF Global Network and our other uh, financial institutions, philanthropists and donor agencies to come up with a blended funding scheme. And I'm, and, um, uh, Jody, who is a very, very important partner and uh, a visionary um, who is going to be speaking after me, who is going to talk more about uh, this component of uh, our blended funding screen for the next um, um, 10 years. So without further ado, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the work of, um, of, um, the, uh, of all of our partners that are part of this program, uh, that are part of this multi-stakeholder platform, and also uh, the communities that we work with, which is allows us to be able to, to come up to this stage and to be able to move forward in the next uh, 10 years, uh, building on the Great Sea Reef Resilience Program to ensure that this Great Sea Reef is um, uh, well managed and protected for the future. Thank you very much, um, and uh, do not hesitate to contact me if you need to learn more about our Great Sea Reef uh, program. Thank you very much, Alfred. Jody, are you there? You with us, Jody Smith? I am here. Join. Yes. Yes. Um, good. Looking forward to hearing from you. You have the floor, Jody. Thanks, Alfred. If you could just stop screen sharing, and I'll launch mine. You should see a stop screen sharing button there, Alfred. Perfect. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, firstly, let me thank uh, WWF Pacific for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I am a private sector person. I'll put my hand up and announce that from the start. Um, so what on earth is a private sector person doing on this panel? Um, well, I'm going to be talking to you today uh, about the work that Matanataki is doing. So Matanataki is a private company. Um, and the work that we are doing both to identify businesses that can bring, uh, bring impact to the Great Sea Reef, uh, as well as some blended finance instruments to do that with. Um, so the logic to our involvement is that the private sector and industry are responsible for almost all of the activities which lead to ecosystem uh, destruction. Um, and if we don't address those, then we, uh, then all conservation efforts will, will be for nothing. Uh, so my background, my personal background is in business turnaround and development. And I was asked to be on the Great Sea Reef Steering Committee in 2017 uh, by Kessa uh, as the uh, kind of local organic expert. Uh, I came to Fiji eight years ago to turn around a failing agricultural business. It was actually the first time I had worked in agriculture. Um, but through that experience, I actually became an ardent defender of the environment, realizing 
recognizing what human beings are doing to the soil. Um, so this led to the formation of Matanataki. So what is, who is Matanataki? So we are an impact focused uh, project and business development firm in Fiji, and we are a partner to WWF and the Great Sea Reef Resilience Program. Uh, we specialize in arranging direct investments into projects and businesses, and we are also working towards raising, uh, raising the funding for and managing two investment uh, investment fund type facilities which will fall under the GSR resilience program. We've screened over 120 businesses in Fiji. We have 40 that we believe can deliver not only uh, environmental positive impact but financial return uh, and that pipeline is valued at around about 75 million US dollars so that's the investment need uh, for those businesses. Uh, we are able to work on a direct investment approach, uh, which we're doing right now because the two facilities, the two funds have not, uh, we haven't started formal fundraising yet. Uh, and we use a blended finance approach and I'll go into a little bit about what that is. So who are we? Well, we were started by the Landscape Finance Lab and Paul Chatterton, who many of you will know. Um, so I like to say that Paul built this wonderful um, playground and asked us to come and play in it. So I'm the local person on the ground. I am the deal originator. I look at, you know, what is the local strategy in terms of these businesses being successful? Who needs to walk together? Uh, Innovent uh, is our partner who is uh, headquartered in Austria, uh, but has offices in India and Nepal. Uh, Innovent uh, specializes in incubating businesses in low income economies. And this is a big bottleneck that we see coming up if there is no business, hands on business support for businesses then they will fail. Uh, Ikigai advises, so Anton is our structuring and investment specialist. He was a banker for uh, 10 years. So we see that the businesses that we're working with roughly fall into three different types. We have early stage, these generally need under 500,000 US dollars investment. Then we have our startups, uh, so Series A to Series C, that refers to a, uh, a point of fundraising at the uh, initial stages of a business. And for these, we're looking at around about half a million US to $5 million of investment. And then we have our larger mature businesses, which are looking for more than 5 million. And we don't have many of those uh, ticket sizes, probably only half a dozen. So as uh, France, uh, sorry, as Alfred mentioned, we uh, we are a partner to the Great Sea Reef Resilience Program. Specifically, we have come to support component two. So the blended finance approach. So if we have the entire program, and then we have a public sector finance uh, of around about forty million, which is being raised currently. And then Matanataki has been raised, uh, has been tasked with raising 50 million US, which will go directly into uh, businesses for investment. And there are two facilities that we're looking to do this through. So one we are calling the Great Sea Reef Devco. This is for larger businesses that can uh, that aren't so high risk and can take on debt and equity. And then we have the uh, Great Sea Reef Community Facility. And this is for smaller businesses, more grassroots businesses that are too high risk for investors. But if these businesses get, uh, get a, a grant and they get the incubation support, then after about three years, they can graduate to being able to go to a bank and take out a loan if they want to grow their business. So the pipeline, uh, what sectors are we working in? So we see uh, these top three sectors here, waste and plastics management, regenerative agriculture and sustainable fisheries and restoration as being the most important sectors. These are the ones that we really want to target because they will have the biggest impact on the health of the reef. And then we have complementary sectors. So tourism, forest restoration and renewable energy. So the GSR community facilities. So what does this facility look like? So it's around about 5 million US dollar facility and it will be funded by money from donor agencies. And then there will be a local Fiji management entity, uh, an FDB uh, type, uh, type entity. So money will be pulled into this facility. And then there will be an investment committee, which will be the donors, 
the management and the NGOs, and they will make the decisions on which businesses receive investment. So the businesses will receive grant investments for technical assistance and operational expenditure, and then for their capital expenditure, so any, uh, any assets they need to purchase, there will be a revolving interest-free loan for those. And the idea of this uh, having a loan uh, portion is really to get the businesses used to repaying uh, a facility so that they will get that experience before they say go to a bank or go to an equity investor. Now the GSR Devco, this is the larger facility. It's around about, uh, it'll be somewhere between 50 to 75 million. So we will have mostly investors here uh, and uh, they will pull their money into this one facility and then donors will put money in which will support the technical assistance. Now investors will not pay for technical assistance and this is really uh, why a blend, this is, this is kind of the core of what blended finance is. You need public money to pay for all of the project business readiness before an investor will put their money in. So as an example, we have a, uh, a large uh, waste project and it needs about $400,000 of public money to get the project ready. Different things like waste stream audits, legal, accounting, that type of work. And then that money will unlock in this case, 13 million of investment into, into that company. And some examples, so the uh, uh, business I just mentioned then uh, is a sanitary landfill and materials recovery facility. So this will, uh, this will be, um, uh, this will replace all of the open dump sites currently sitting either on riversides or mangroves in the, uh, the north and west of Viti Levu. Uh, we have another company which uh, is making non-synthetic fertilizers from green and ma manure waste currently going to landfill. Uh, so this product we're aiming to, uh, to roll out to sugarcane farmers who are on, uh, who are on waterways and, and on coasts. And this way they'll be able to build the humus levels in their soil. Uh, we want to use them really as a buffer so that there are no chemicals running off in, into the waterways. Uh, very quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, uh, we have also a coastal restoration company, uh, a, a, a sea cucumber farming uh, business. Uh, and then these are two smaller businesses, very community focused. So one is a coconut oil business that is uh, uh, moving into making surfboard wax and a beeswax group, which will be supplying the surfboard wax company. And... And then we have a floating solar company and we have the world's first zero liquid discharge solar desalination company. And with all of these, I want to stress, we work hand in hand with, uh, with the experts, you know, WWF, the other CSOs, academia, to make sure that the environmental impact will be achieved because that is not our expertise. We are the, the business, the financial people, but we are not the conservation experts. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. It was uh, a lot of information. I know we've 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 covered a lot of uh, territory uh, in through these speakers, but uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me that there is so much uh, rich uh, activity going on with WWF Pacific and partners, and uh, and it was good to be able to to go through that. We only have a few minutes left, and uh, I'm just going to check on the the Q and A function to see. We've had some very uh, encouraging and uh, and appreciative comments coming through in the chat, um, which which is good to see. Uh, we don't have any questions, but I I would like to just ask one if I can, and I want to address it to Minnie if you're still there, Minnie and Rebecca, because you guys are really on the ground working with communities, which is an area. So Jody, I'm not sure why we still have you on there, but that's good. Anyhow, um, and Rebecca, I stop the screen share. <laughs> right, Rebecca and um, and Minnie, as you go about your daily work, working with communities, coastal communities on the front line, as we say, I mean, what what do what do they tell you? They see as the greatest challenges they face in terms of in terms of the 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 coasts that they live on and the resilience. Is it climate change, for instance? 
Is it overfishing? Is it health? Is it education? I'm just really interested in, in a comment from both of you on that, that factor. Who'd like to go first, Minnie? Or Rebecca? Um, can you please repeat the question? So I'm just, I'm just interested as you work with the communities, what do you feel um, they are saying is, the, is their greatest uh, concern? Is it, is it climate change? Is it, is it education? Is it, uh, is it their financial well-being? What, what do you feel, or is it all a mix of all of the above? Please. You go first, Rebecca. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's kind of a mix of all the above, but I think mm -hmm. for my the area where I work for Malay, I think the most uh, you know uh, uh, concern for our community pe people right now is the impacts of climate change and food security. Okay, good. And, and Minnie, did you have a comment? Um, I guess we are the same with um, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. The main concern is on climate change and the impacts on food security. Thank you. And, and we have a question in the chat for you, Jody, just as we're, as we're finishing up. Um, so that was really, really interesting and I'll, I'll be coming back to you on some of that uh, going forward. But um, Jackie's saying, do you see, have you, have you looked outside the Great Sea Reef, which is an incredibly uh, consuming area, I understand, but have you looked across at uh, similar opportunities um, working with communities in Papua New Guinea and Solomons? We haven't yet. Uh, so the Great Sea Reef Resilience Program, I understand the, the, uh, there, there is a Solomons component so WWF US is looking at it actually being a, a Pacific Resilient Reefs program with Solomon's being next. Um, so, so no, we don't know a whole lot about what's going on there in terms of business. Um, I've, I've spent a day with Shannon talking about Solomon, so I, I have some ideas, um, but it would be a, a case really for us. We, ha we have a methodology, a way of, you know, how we would approach identifying different businesses. But the key thing for us really is finding partners on the ground who, who have that local, that local knowledge. Thanks. Oh, and, and by the way, I just want to mention we have an, um, our investors are always asking us, you know, what else do you have? Do you have anything else other than Fiji? So, yeah. Yeah. And we, we have um, begun building a very exciting initiative, which is called Acceleration of Community Led Coastal Conservation. It's a global initiative. Um, we're partnering with, with Whirlfish and Blue Ventures and, and uh, uh, EDF on that. And certainly there's a lot of interest in what's happening in, in the Pacific um, from, from the, uh, the investors in that program. So um, a lot of rich material to build on, to build on there. We, time has, has defeated us. Again, I'd like to thank all the, the, the speakers um, for their contribution and their comments. I found it very informative, very interesting. I'd like to congratulate WWF Pacific on 25 years of building, building resilience for ecosystems and more importantly, perhaps, or underpinning building resilience for coastal communities. Um, so on behalf of the global program, I'd say thank you very much. Thanks to the speakers and uh, look forward to working with you as you go forward. Thank you very much.